And thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Integrating Backup into Your CICD Pipeline. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then I'll hand over to Michael Cade, senior technologist and member of technical staff at Cast In by Veeam. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee, but there is this lovely chat that everyone is commenting in. Thank you for doing so. Keep saying hello and put your questions there and uh, we will get to them either at the end or whenever Michael takes a little break and it, it works out and we'll get to as many as we can. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They will also be available via the registration link you use to get into this webinar today. And it will also be on our online programs YouTube playlist, which is linked in the chat. With that, I will hand it over to Michael to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Libby. Um, yeah, hey, everyone, um, and everyone on the recording as well. But yeah, in terms of questions, I'd just like to say that, yeah, I'll get to I'll get to as many as possible. Um, it's super important to get that feedback and answer those questions, because I appreciate that a lot of us are in different, uh, different times of their journey, whether it comes to complete rookies or pros when it comes to the cloud native landscape. So I appreciate that we're going to be talking about a couple of areas that are probably a little bit more advanced, but I'm going to try and simplify them as best I can so that people get an understanding of where we're putting this project. Um, I've spoken about Canister before um, as a project. I've just put some of the links in and I'm going to touch on some of those areas as well as part of the session. Um, but really the the premise of the, the session is really about integrating backup into your GitOps and I put CI CD pipeline It's more so your CD pipeline. I'm going to get into why, why that, because really the CI and CD, you always see it put together, but actually the CI, CI is one thing, CD is another, they are closely linked, but it's about deployment. It's about delivery of your, your applications. Um, just before we move on to the next slide and start walking through some of this, a bit of the theory before we get into a bit of live demo is that I'm Michael Cade. I'm a senior global technologist. I live within the office of the CTO at Veeam, but really concentrating on our cloud, nat cloud native ecosystem, both open source and commercial products. Also, if we don't get around to answering any of your, your questions today, then you can find me on, on the social, like on Twitter at Michael Cade one, more than happy to get involved and, and help, um, with any queries that you have with anything that we're doing over, over at, at Caston from an open source perspective. Um, so I mentioned around continuous integration and continuous deployment and generally being two separate methods or ideologies that we have when we're creating applications or deploying or, or delivering our applications. So continuous integration is we've, going to create something, we're going to create our applications, we're then going to put it into some sort of version control, we're then going to build it, maybe we're going to put it into Docker Hub, and we're going to test it, make sure that everything's good. And then the software is available on Docker Hub for us to take. Now, the more and more I speak to a lot of our like community is actually that bit is done by a lot of software engineers and, and software delivery companies as such as well. And we're starting to get more commercial products or more open source products available in the Docker Hub or in any container registry for that matter, um, as it closely links here. But we can also think about how software is deployed, developed from a from a more traditional ecosystem point of view when it lands into ISOs or different binaries that we then want to be able to leverage. And it's really that release phase where all of us regardless of your background, whether you're an operations person that comes from um, looking after platforms as a platform engineer, as an infrastructure admin, as a um, people that are ultimately keeping the lights on for, for and delivering the, the as a service and the fundamental infrastructure underneath that, 
the release is has always been there. We've always constantly we've built our virtual machines, our physical machines. We've installed software on top, and then the release cadence has always been whatever that's been from the software vendor, and we've deployed that out into our into our ecosystem or into our environment. Now, or you're coming from a developer point of view, where you're the you're the people that are actually writing the code, version controlling that, releasing that, building that, testing that, and you're looking after that. Or you're in the DevOps where you kind of linger in between, and you've got a bit of everything that you're that you're concentrating on. So the real focus for me today is around this bottom part of the of the diagram, and hopefully you you can still all see my slides building out here. But it's really from that release. Now in this example, I'm using Docker Hub as my source, but really that could be any container registry, any binary, or anything that you're you're deploying in your in your environment. So again, we're gonna we're gonna have that update. We're gonna have version one. Version one gets controlled through our potentially our own version control system, and then we're gonna deploy that. Most likely, you're gonna deploy that into a staging environment, and then you're going to validate that version one is good. Version two is now out, and we're happy how that looks from a staging point of view before we then release and deploy that into our production. Hopefully, that makes sense. There's a bit of a high level overview between continuous or well, CI and CD. Um, but what, 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 why am I coming on here and starting to talk about backup in this instance? Because if we think about over on the left hand side, we've got our developers. Our developers are creating their version controlled software and they're putting it onto GitHub and they're potentially then releasing that out into your environment using a product called, and I'm using another open source tool here called Argo CD which is focused on the continuous deployment of your service. And that gives us our application, our Kubernetes ap application, for example, or everything that consists of that, whether it be ingress services, deployment, staple sets, um, persistent volumes. And that's great. And version one comes out, version two comes out. And that, for the most part, a sync can be great. And it, it's going to keep, keep updating for you. And that's why one of the big reasons GitOps over the last 12 to 18 months has been a really big um, focus area for a lot of businesses because we're get, now getting to the stage of, well, how do we automate that deployment better and in a much more efficient manner? But then when we think about, okay, I just mentioned persistent volumes there as part of that. So let's say that we've got some sort of database, a MySQL database, and now we've got potentially customers writing data in a way to that database could be customers, but it also equally could be people internally. And we're right into that persistent volume. And MySQL is the application, the backend database that I'm going to use because I'm going to use that in my in my example as well. So what happens there? Like we've got the application in version control. So I can roll back and I can roll forward from a version one to two to three. And I can even roll back to version two if things go wrong and they don't look right. But version control is not going to be looking after your MySQL database, which has an external um, user input, whether that be a user input from internal users or customers outbound. But ultimately, that data doesn't get um, doesn't get stored in version control. So that's a concern for us, is that all of our version control, our GitHub, our repositories that we have out there is going to bring back all of our Kubernetes objects and our, our artifacts. It's going to bring it back into, into play. However, if something has manipulated that data, then we're not going to have a copy of that data. And what, why this is really interesting is if we, like we have the, we have a concept of config maps within Kubernetes, which allows us to interact with external services, but also external data sets. And it's quite common that those config maps get used to manipulate data. It might be that we want to remove something or we want to change the way we see that data, or maybe we're shipping that data between one database to another. Well, those config maps, if maybe you've made a mistake through that co code control, and you've decided to delete all of the data, obviously not through choice, um, then that data is not captured at that point. So one of the key areas that we've been talking about or thinking about from a canister open source project point of view is, well, how do we make that simpler for the people that are deploying the application within our environment, whether that is the developer, the DevOps, or the platform engineer, and everything in between, but 
how can we make sure that before we go from version one to version two, that we have a level of protection against that? Um, and that's where it comes in is to, well, how do we, how do we prov prov provoke or how do we start a backup job or some sort of data move but before we make any version control or code changes so that if anything was to happen in the code, how can we ensure that we've got a copy of that data in a safe location? So I keep saying about data, data has been highlighted and, and bolded and capitalized all the way through this. Um, but, and, and I'll, I'll keep on saying as well about any persistent data or volumes used by applications, well, they're not captured generally through version control. There might be some in terms of lot lo login systems, messaging queues, but you're not really gonna wanna store them in your lean, um, efficient GitHub repository. Um, but basically any stateful set that we have within our environment, such as a relational database, such as uh, NoSQL or, or a NoSQL database, um, that is going to, you're not gonna be storing that data, that database or the data within that in a version control system. So it requires the entire application stack including the the data now we've already we've already established that we have all the code and that's great and in other words like we can always deploy version one two and three again that's always a, a should be an easy role now for anything more orchestrated around that you might want to go down the route of looking at other products that allow us to do that as in an all-encompassed way but the data is the most important part if you couldn't tell and the, the data and its dependencies of the stack need to be discovered, tracked, and captured in a way similar to what we do with version control, but version control, such as Git, will not capture what that is. And the way in which we're going to do that in part of our, our demonstration in a, in a short while is we're going to use something from a canister point of view called an action set. And an action set can be triggered either via a cron job out of band, so we just make that happen on a daily basis, hourly basis, using a cron job within Kubernetes. And we're looking at how we can better orchestrate that. But then also, how it, it also allows us to use our CD pipelines to trigger that action set, which then off, allows us to offload that into a external data service. So whether that be something like AWS S3 or S3, MinIO, for example, and Canister is the 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 linchpin to, to be able to move that application data out of the container and into, into a, a solid external source. So in the scenario, what we're gonna do is, I'm not gonna use the staging area because I could do, and it's just gonna confuse what it looks like on, 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 a, on a demo. So I've already deployed Argo CD. And what I've done here in particular is that this could be any Kubernetes cluster anywhere in the world. It could be EKS, it could be AKS, managed Kubernetes. But I'm actually going to use Minikube, another open source um, framework for deploying Kubernetes. Um, I'm going to use Git on my local Linux machine, and we're going to update, we're going to do some stuff to our application, and we're going to deploy it to our Kubernetes environment, our Minikube environment. What we're also going to do is we're going to deploy MySQL, and we're going to add some external data so imagine and i'll get to that and i'll show you what that looks like is a user is going to dive into our container connect to it and it's going to push some data into the database in fact if we want to think about this as a, a vet clinic and a database we're going to push some data into that database from that perspective then we're going to um, something that's going to modify that data now i'm not going to simulate a config map i'm just literally going to change that data um, or I'm going to modify that data in a way. We'll see when we get to it. But then let's say that mistakes were made. Someone dropped the table. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to drop the table. Or some other failure scenario has made that mistake for us. So we now lo no longer have access to that data. Our data is gone. By all accounts, in that application, our data is gone. So then what we're going to do is we're going to leverage Canister to not only be backing up that data, but we're also going to um, so we're going to back up everything to an S3 bucket. I'm actually going to use MinIO, also hosted on the Minikube cluster. Not best practice because if you lose the whole Minikube cluster, 
then you're out of business. You don't have an external data copy of your of your um, application data. But for the purpose of the demo, think of that as an external copy of the data as simulated through this, this image. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, again, leverage Canister with another action set. So within Canister, we have an action set that enables us to back up. And then we also have an action set that allows us to restore. Now, they use the similar API. It's just about being a push or a pull into whatever, however it's getting that data back into our environment. So then we go back, we fix our mistakes, i.e. we restore or we change that config map or whatever needs to happen so that our code is good, our version is good again, and then we can restore that data back into, back into our environment. Now, I'm going to run through this. We might run through it again at the end just to make sure that um, we're clear on the execution walkthrough and how Canister works. But basically, what we're going to do, and I've already done that. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't done this. Um, I'm going to go and deploy Canister using the Helm chart into our Minikube environment. And you can see there that's known as the controller, the operator that we have within there. And then we're going to, we have something called, we're going to leverage something called a blueprint. And you can see an example of all the blueprints, the stable blueprints that we already have created for all of the various different data services out there. Now, I said about relational databases. I said about NoSQL databases, but you'll see from that list, they're not the only ones. We've got things like Elasticsearch. I know there's a Kafka one being worked on as well. There's a any data service that is using a database workload or, or some sort of um, persistent volume. We can generally use a blueprint to lift data from A to B. And that's the quite exciting thing about where Canister is at the moment. So... Then we create an, a, the action set that I mentioned. And an action set consists of a backup. It consists of the blueprint that we're going to be using for that. And it's a set of instructions that basically say, I want you to do this with this particular um, application. And if it's MySQL, then I'm going to do uh, X, Y, Z as part of the, the um, dump of that. It could be Postgres and do a PG dump, et cetera. And then it's going to push that out into our into our profile, which is one thing I don't have on here, but it's gonna we're gonna get to. So the action set comes in. You either run this when you want to run it, or you have it part of your cron job. In our execution walkthrough, in our demo, we're going to be using Argo CD to trigger this. The controller then looks for the blueprint that we're asking for. Again, we'll we'll go and deploy that as well. And then what that does is it executes a canister function against that database workload and then allows us to offload that into object storage or by taking a, a, the ability to leverage a cloud snapshot from that point. I believe this can also go to NFS, but don't quote me on that. I need to need to check. I've not done it. But object storage is, is normally the de facto for where we're storing those backups, which is a good good um, good place to be storing an off-site copy of our, of our data. Then from a recovery point of view, we're going to, again, we're going to leverage that action set and we're going to basically perform the, re the reverse of what we just went through. So let me just check the time. Okay, we're good on time. So you've seen we've got our app, we've got Argo CD already deployed. We've got MinIO with a canister bucket already deployed. So just a couple of things to, I'll just check if there are any questions. I think we're good. Did did they um, progress at all, the slides? If not, okay. Cheers, Ivan. Um, okay, cool. So you should be able to see this inception screen at the moment, which is not pretty for anyone. Um, just a couple of resources. I have posted them in the chat, but they might have been early on. So kind of just want to run through a couple of places where you can go and find more about Canister. One is canister.io, super simple. It's going to give you a bit more information about what it is we're going to show. But as a project, I'm going to show you one aspect that Canister can be used. Canister can absolutely be used as a standalone tool to just take those point in time backups of your application data. So um, you'll find here you can go and fork it on GitHub, give it a star, interact with us, have a discussion, give us your ideas contribute more than more than welcome to to get involved with with what we're doing over here 
Um, I'll deploy it as well. The instructions are also there. Another one is docs.canister.io. Um, again, this is just going to go into a little bit more detail. This could be another great area for contribution in terms of like run through it for us, see what it looks like, give us feedback on the documentation. One of my biggest uh, pet peeves, gripes is documentation. So I want it to, I want it to basically walk me through how to get a project up and running. And I know that's a big thing when it comes to the the, the cloud native landscape. Is documentation has been like a real focus for a lot of the projects that we're working on. And then obviously the the uh, the GitHub page where the project resides you can see that it's very active so three days ago was the last last commit you can see that the releases are going up it is a helm chart deployment but go and have a play everything's written in go um you'll also see a list of community applications as well as stable applications if you go into examples and stable then you'll see that long list that i had in the slides and then also just take a look at some of the other um, community uh, workings that we have at the moment. So being able to use Canister to protect AWS RDS. So not, al not always does the data service live within the Kubernetes cluster. So we wanna be able to protect that, but maybe the application, maybe the front end, maybe the stateless part of the application does live within the Kubernetes cluster and the data lives outside. Well, we, we can use Canister to be able to protect that from that point of view. You also see things like Kafka in here, as well as a demo system called Timelog. Um, what else was I gonna show on here? Uh, okay, yeah, the, the steps in which I'm gonna walk through from a demo perspective. So this is actually on my own. I don't know if I did link this, I'll link it quickly now so you can all see and get ahead of what we're going to be doing. I don't know if I did share that at the beginning. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to install Canister. So in fact, roll back one. We're going to deploy Minikube. Again, this will work on any of your x86 Kubernetes clusters. Um, I'm just using Minikube because a lot of us don't have access to AKS, EKS, GKE, managed Kubernetes services. So being able to use Minikube on literally pretty much any, any um, desktop machine, laptop, this gives us a, a huge opportunity to be able to leverage that and actually see it because I think that's one of my big things about learning and learning in public is well, it needs to be accessible. Um, so how to how to install Canister? So we run through adding the the Helm repository, creating the namespace. We'll run through this, deploying Argo CD. I've put the steps in. I'm not going to do that today. I've already deployed it, as you saw. And then we're going to create a bucket in Minikube, going to deploy Minikube. Again, I've already done that. Um, loads of great resources out there to say how Argo CD is deployed and MinIO. So I probably don't need to go into that too much. Then we're going to create a canister profile using CanCTL. Now, CanCTL is the CLI for canister. Um, original naming um, is that this gives us the ability to create those three things that we first spoke about. So being able to create your profile, but then also being able to um, interact with those blueprints as well as being able to create the action set as well. So we're gonna create the canister profile using CanCTL. We're then going to create or deploy a canister blueprint. You can see that I'm taking it directly from that stable MySQL blueprint.yaml. If we can go and look at that again in the, in the GitHub repository. And then we'll just confirm that we've got it. And then what we're going to do, and this is, so at that point, I could just use Canister to go and protect my application that's been deployed without using Argo CD, but that probably wouldn't fit the bill for the for the session. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in into Argo CD. We're going to create a new um, MySQL application, our pet clinic database. We're going to run through these steps. We're going to create some data. And you can see here that we're just going to add um, one hamster into our database. Um, and then we're going to sync our project. So that's going to then go and deploy our application out into our Kubernetes cluster, our Minikube cluster. And then we're going to go and introduce that bad change into our application. Now, this is actually going to be us deploying a MySQL client. And you can see here, I'm pretty sure I made it quite 
uh, quite clear. We're going to create a database called test in the previous step, and we're going to just simply drop that database as part of the deployment of MySQL client. So then we commit, we push that, think about that as version two of our code set, and then we're going to dive in. You're going to see here we don't have any uh, any test database anymore. So then we need to obviously be able to restore that, and this is where we then take advantage of can ctl as well and i'll touch on actually a, a couple of areas of well where do i get can ctl obviously there's the ability to get can ctl from the uh releases page of um of uh the github but then also being able to leverage something like arcade so arcade from a alex ellis point of view an open source application marketplace kubernetes marketplace and in here you're going to find canister is available within within here um so i think that was it i think me jumping around isn't probably helping but uh so yeah we're going to restore our database and get get our data back so let's jump into visual studio so just to confirm our environment, so I have uh, a mini cube just called Simple MC Demo. We're using the Docker driver. We're using Container D as the runtime. Blah blah blah. Port version of Kubernetes and how many nodes? You can also see here that we have that one node, and then you can see here that we have these namespaces. So we have Argo CD. We have our our default namespaces, and then we have MinIO. Obviously, we don't have any canister. So what we want to do first is we want to add canister helm. Now, I already have that. So if I do helm repo list, you're going to see that I have canister in, in play already. And I have just done an update beforehand. So I'm deploying the or I have the latest helm charts available. So let's then go ahead and create our namespace. And then we're going to deploy canister using these. So Helm install, my release in the namespace of canister, canister operator, which we'll see in a sec. And then we're going to use a, an image tag of version 71. Now, it should work with 72 as well. I'm not as daring, but 72 only just came out, as you saw, three days ago. I haven't tested it. I wanted the demo to, to go as it should. Okay, so we can go and deploy that. This doesn't take very long at all to spin up. Before we do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and check out some custom resource definitions that get deployed as part of the Helm deploy of, of Canister. So you can see that there's three, if we'll maybe jump in the gun a little. So hopefully you can see that, that we have three. We have our action sets, which is what we use to back up, but also to recover. We have our blueprints, which is there to integrate or interact with our database. And we have our profiles, which is where we're gonna store our backups. So you can see that we create these custom resource, resource, custom resource definitions so that we can then leverage that as part of the, the Kubernetes API. So if I then quickly run a kubectl get pods under canister okay good stuff less than a minute and we're up we've deployed argo cd like i mentioned we've created our bucket in uh uh we've deployed mini min io and we've created our, our canister bucket and we're in there already so we don't need that and now we need to run can ctl so let's clear this so that we can concentrate on this so we can see here that we're going to create a new profile. So if I do a uh, kubectl get pro, let's do the full API. You see that there isn't a profile in our namespace, but we want to create that. And this is going to create the location profile for us to store our backups in that min.io. So I've already set these environment variables with the commands up above. So in theory, unless I've cleared out my cache, which is absolutely possible, um, I should be able to run all of this 
and it goes and creates a secret as part of that using the access key and the secret key and it creates our profile now if i go back and run get those profiles in theory there should be one now called s3 profile 6v nv9 okay so we've confirmed that we have that profile i've jumped ahead um notice as well if if i was to use so here in the instructions and i need to change that and maybe anyone on the call that wants to dive in and, and just contribute that to my um, repo if i do a kubectl uh, get profile i think it's profiles and then minus n canister uh, so if you run other applications that use profile that's why i had to use the whole um, crd api string clearly i got rid of the application that was using it, it was actually Kasten that also uses profile so there would have been two profiles um available which would have come back and said that doesn't work okay so next up we want to create a canister blueprint so canister uses blueprints to define these data database specific so in our instance we're going to be deploying a mysql um application so i want to go and create that blueprint based on that stable uh one that we have in our git repo or github repo i should say okay so we can check that in our environment make sure that has created like no spoilers here it's definitely going to be there because it just said created okay now we're going to flip to argo cd to deploy our app and we're going to create a namespace called mysql i'm actually not going to do that because we can do it as part of the the app deployment um create in argo a new project mysql app project name mysql and use the default project so what i need first is i need to jump into here uh, and i need to take that and i need to jump into here and we'll go new app so we're going to call this what did it say mysql I've probably kept it quite simple. Project name, MySQL, namespace, MySQL. Super simple, right, MySQL. Project is gonna be default. We're gonna use a sync policy of manual. Now you might, in your own testing, wanna make this automatic, so any new changes happen, they can automatically be rolled out within your environment. Um, we haven't created that namespace, so we wanna tick that the instructions state to create it but i'm going off piece a little um repository url is argo cd canister and i think everything lives in base yep everything lives in base so back to that um so sometimes if, if you've ever seen me do this demo before we could use base or we could just say right everything everything available in our whole github repository we could just say dot and that goes recursive through through everything um might save someone a couple of seconds going through going through um the documentation uh cluster url so the default cluster url and our mysql namespace we could say directory recurse as well here to go through everything but i think before we do that let me go back down here let's clear this let's show that i have uh okay no mysql database or mysql namespace sorry so let's do a let's do a get pods mysql that might fail because there isn't one no nope, we're good at the moment so if i go create Okay, I now need to go into this, but it's saying it's out of sync. But you can see here that it's going to go and deploy the MySQL. It's going to deploy the MySQL namespace with a secret called MySQL, a service called MySQL, and a um, a stateful set called MySQL. So if I want to then go and sync that, 
and start things going on, we can just hit sync and then synchronize. And if I go into here, we should, in theory, as long as nothing breaks. I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, good stuff. But what you'll see here is that we've actually already kicked off a canister pre-sync. I'm going to show you what that looks like as well. So if we have a look at our, where's our go? Now you, you suddenly now see a load more things that have appeared. So we have our canister pre-sync, um, which is actually a, 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 a user account. We have a job. We have a role-based access um, admin role and a, an operator. Okay, good. I'm glad that did that. And basically, if we go into if we go into the base and we look at what that canister pre precinct pre job looks like, you're going to see that these two annotations enable us to, before any commit happens of anything else, we are going to run this canister precinct, this precinct, and the wave two so that in order for us to take that back up. Now, if we run through this, you're going to see that we're going to create an image, we're going to deploy a container, and we're going to run a few things that look very familiar to a, a profile and an action set. Notice that we didn't create an action set as part of our um, canister getting ready, our, our, our walkthrough canister, because we're actually going to do it here. So uh, what else does it do? It then throws that data so everything looks good that pod is just coming up if i go into here again we're going to see that mysql is one of one um let's go back into our that should refresh any second and if we go into our minio browser although there's nothing there we should see and this might kick me out because there was nothing to back up because there wasn't actually a MySQL database um, to back up. So our action set would have gone in there and gone, there's no, there's nothing, nothing to back up. So with that, what's going on here? Let's just hit refresh. Okay, everything's good. Okay, so what does it want us to do next? So let's clear that. So our application is now running. Version one has been deployed. We've got a safe, canister precinct that we know is running but we don't have any data because we have no data in our environment right now um so once deployed check the service account that was the essay that i was thinking of is the service account for canister precinct can create an action or read a profile set now we created this as part of our job so i'm hoping that it comes back and says yes you can um so we're checking these these two um service accounts and that's good the answer should be yes for both good stuff okay now we're going to actually go and create some data so think about this as being the external data set and someone is coming through maybe a web portal and they're submitting some information that they want to be stored on this database um so what we're going to do is we're going to connect into our pod again this probably this this is us simulating us wanting or needing to be in in there so let's do this copy this and you'll see now we have puffball a hamster that was born in 1999 showing there and now we can just come out of that because what we want to do now is simulate a code change coming into our repository. So by resyncing your project, you're going to trigger the creation of a backup. Okay, so let's minimize that. Let's sync again, which is not going to change anything in our database. But what it is going to do is it's going to go and create that, that canister pre-sync job again. And now when this finishes, we're going to see something in MinIO. So what else does it say? Oh, that's for the bad bit. We'll do that in a sec. And let's just take a look in here. Oh, 
Oh, as if by magic. There's my MySQL backups. And you'll see that in here, if we drill down, we've got a date, we've got a time, but we've got that MySQL dump. Now we could take that and we could go and deploy that and restore that into any other MySQL. And that's another, another session for another time is it gives us the ability to be quite fluid in where we take that data. Um, obviously, I'm using very unsecure, um, not best practice because of the sake of time and demo. But you can see here that everything's good. We've synced. Everything is OK. So back in here, and hopefully everyone's still following along with my um, sporadic changes in Windows. So let's imagine you create a MySQL client app, which is going to drop your database in your code. That's a mistake, but mistakes happen. Um, so create this pod. So I want to create, I want to create this. In fact, here's one I made earlier. Now, if I just go and drop that in there and I do a git um, add and I do a git commit and I say add in a bad change and I say git push. I don't think this will show you anything. No, nope, good stuff. And then if we go back in here and we go back to our base, we should see added a bad change. And in here, we should see our MySQL client. Okay, good stuff. Now, because we had it set to manual, if we press refresh now, it's going to say we're out of sync because we're missing this MySQL client pod. So if we now hit sync and synchronize, and if we go back to our environment, and we go to clear and we do a, a k get pods mysql we can do a watch on there because we're going to actually remember we're going to go and create we're, we're creating that client but we're also going to take a backup first so we are going to take a backup before we deploy our new mysql client covering us because Think about this as going from version one to version two, but some of our code is going to manipulate our database, our actual core data service. So when that's done, we want to jump back in. And remember I showed you as part of that, uh, my MySQL client is that that's going to drop the database test, the test database that we created. I should be more original with how I call these databases part of the demo. Um, so I'm being impatient, but I think that's because there's stuff going on still. Let's just check. Let's go back. Let's go back in there. Okay, there's the two. So we've got one that went before and one that went after. So Okay, but let's go and check whether we have any data in our databases. Or actually, is the pod, or did the pod actually just self? It might have just got rid of itself straight away. Yeah, it was it was purely there to be a, um, malicious. So let's now jump into our mysql one or mysql zero sorry our pod that we have and let's simply go and check our databases show database oh and now our test database is is no longer here and oh the horror the sync has deleted the database but fortunately canister protects your database in the execution of the pre-sync okay so what have we got left 10 minutes 10 minutes to get the data back so first of all we before so the sync above represents a simple change in code that could affect our data at this stage the bad mysql client yaml should be removed or configured correctly before continuing with the restore process so this is really me saying about this could be a a, um, a config map this could be any but whatever whatever you've just committed to your database is or whatever you've just committed in terms of code has manipulated your data 
and cause some cause some bad stuff. So what we want to do is let's uh, let's pull drag that out of there and put it back to where it was. Let's exit out of here again. Let's do a get add and get commit minus m. Let's say removing bad SQL, my SQL client. And then push that up. Good stuff. Did it before it timed out on the on the last bit. Um, okay, so before we restore, we should check that we've got those restore points. We looked at and we saw them in, inside MinIO, inside our object storage. But actually, let's um, let's take a look at action set and it's stored within the data center. Uh, sorry, within the canister namespace. Okay, so we have two. They look very different to those in terms of naming because we want to be able to name and differentiate when and when these were taken. So what we're going to do is when we have the list, we choose the correct action set to restore from. Now I want to go back to this one because that one's the, the latest and we know that that one was before the code change in terms of the, the code change that manipulated our, our data. So let's run can CTL, let's do namespace. I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm just going to go and find what that is called again, which is this one. Let's copy that and drop that in there. And so now what we're doing with can CTL. So can CTL is used to create your profiles in terms of where you're going to store your backups, but it's also used to create your action sets. Now, if we weren't using Argo CD to create our action set, we would be able to use CanCTL to create that here. But you'll see here that action is a restore, not a backup from our restore set. So we can hit enter here and we can see that it was created. And if we run, yeah, if we run, now how lazy can I be? CubeCTL, namespace canister describe action set and then let's delete that restore action set so you see now that we want to go and pull this action set because we created a new one called called that i've missed off the r need that right paste okay so now we're, what this is going to do is give us a description of everything that's happened. So we executed the action restore. We executed it from blob store, meaning object storage. We completed that restore phase. And then we updated the action set, restore, blah, 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 um, to status complete. Okay, that seems pretty good. So let's now go back into our pod. And it's as if by magic, I've restored our mission critical database. So jump back in, run that same simple command again. We don't need to create, oh, I just want to show it. There you go, there's another change that needs doing. Um, so we're going to connect to MySQL and show databases. And you see here that we've got test. Let's just make sure that our little hamster is, is there. Uh, I didn't check database. Use test. Use test. Um, select from pets. Good stuff. Diane will be happy that we now have her data back in our database. And then if we go over to, so remember we changed, um, we took away this MySQL client. So if we go and sync that now, in theory, that should get, well, it won't be deployed again. But a new backup will take place. If we come back into our base, you'll see that our um, MySQL client has gone. Um, we made that change. You see removing the bad MySQL client. So back in here, we should be seeing that another canister precinct will be taking place.
we should have another backup in here eventually yeah all good and then version two or version three has now been deployed and we're back in back in business but we've also made sure that the operations teams can obviously use action sets to set their cron jobs to go off at 8, 8 p.m every night if they want that or every hour but now we're enabling our developers or our application owners or our devops teams to be able to automate and integrate into their cd pipelines the ability to protect their workloads as well so if them to if the version gets updated we want to take a backup and also that doesn't stop the the uh, the operations team being able to do the same thing okay just on time so let me are there any questions at all uh sorry if the screen share is glitchy i'm i have done a recording of this so i'll um i'll make sure that i have a have that available as well as part of the 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 readme um i see some people are all good and some people are having issues mm -hmm. with audio so um i'm just all seeing right. if there's any questions yeah any questions anyone Nobody? <laughs> Maybe I said it too quick. <laughs> I think you were just very thorough. I think you did a great job. All right. Good well, stuff. if there are no questions, Michael, if there's anything you have to wrap up with, I'll let you do that. And then we can give everybody a couple minutes back. But the recording will be on YouTube at the link on the YouTube playlist um, after the after this ends of sometime this afternoon and you'll be able to find it through your registration link as well. Yeah. So anything just, else? Yeah. Just to finish up, hopefully I'm sharing my screen again is canister is obviously a, a big focus for, for us from an open source perspective. Um, some of these features are already in, so I just want to highlight these three big features. Um, file store destinations. I mentioned NFS, maybe I just blew the cover off that, but, um, that that's one of the destinations as well as others also being able to encrypt the dupe and compress those as well using another binary called can do um and then improving our canister functions to manage certain data services like or data service operators such as kate sandra's so from from data stacks and their open source initiative there again this is a big shout out this is a community effort um Anyone that wants to take a look, ask questions, learn more, contribute, we're all very welcome, welcome into that. Go and take a look, see what you think, ask the questions. And I think on closing, um, please take a look at the, the project. Um, I think there's some really cool stuff in there. This is just a a little bit of the, 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 the puzzle, like I said, about we could go into a canister overview, which we've done in the in the past. Um, there's some other areas around protecting like AWS RDS or, or data services outside the cluster. The way in which we make this better is feedback from the community and contributions. Spread the word. And yeah, the concentration here is it's an open source framework for application level data management on specifically Kubernetes. So yeah, I think with that, that's probably a good place to, to finish it, Libby. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, again, you will find the recordings later today um, along with the slide deck. So just look for that there. And if you have any questions, join us on Slack or reach out directly and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody.